Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we will discuss non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You are familiar with these drugs. Most of the time when we are having fever or we are having some aches and pains or headache, then we use ponstone, we use brufen, we use dicloran or aspirin or paracetamol. These all are included under the heading of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. So first of all we will see what are the learning objectives of these three lectures. We will, we will learn all these drugs in three lectures. In first lecture we will talk about aspirin most of the time they were pharmacological actions and in the second lecture we will see what are the clinical uses and different adverse effects of these NSAIDs and in the last lecture we will talk about the paracetamol uh, which is also included under the heading of NSAIDs but it is having no anti-inflammatory properties. So at the end of these lectures you will be able to classify NSAIDs then you will be able to describe pharmacological actions of aspirin. We are talking about aspirin because aspirin is a prototype of NSAIDs. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, when we talk about these drugs, aspirin is the prototype of these drugs. Then you will be able to describe the therapeutic uses of aspirin with, the, with, with its various dosage forms and then how to explain the adverse effects as well as the contraindications of aspirin you will be able to differentiate between the adverse effects as well as other contraindications of aspirin then you will be able to differentiate between aspirin and other NSA as I told you aspirin is a prototype but it, it is different from other NSAs in some specific areas it is having some specific action which we will discuss and then you will be able to enlist COX-2 selective NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They are inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 and out of these we have got a group which is selective for COX-2. So you will be able to enlist COX-2 selective NSAIDs and explain their adverse effects then you will be able to describe the mechanism of action of acetaminophen acetaminophen is paracetamol its its mechanism is somewhat different from NSAIDs and then you will be able to differentiate between acetaminophen or paracetamol and other NSAIDs and as we know that acetaminophen or paracetamol in high dosage or with hepatic to hepatic uh, dysfunction can lead to more hepatic toxicity so we will explain you will be able to explain that also so first of all we will just review the pathophysiology of inflammation you are familiar with this just i am revising that during acute inflammation the cell damage due to injury or infection this this lead to release of lysosomal enzymes from the leukocytes and release of precursors of autocoids and their synthesis increases and these autocoids are histamine, serotonin and radikinins, prostaglandins and leukotrienes and all this lead to the symptoms of inflammation which are vasodilatation, there is redness, there is edema, there is pain as well as there is fever. So immune response also come into play and immune cells they get activated by any foreign or any antigenic substances and they try to destroy the invading organism and or may lead to conversion of this acute inflammation to chronic inflammation by the release of interleukins, TNF alpha, interferons and other prostaglandins and ultimately this leads to pain as well as damage to the surrounding tissue ultimately leading to 
damage to the area where there was inflammation and in chronic process there can be damage to the bones or the cartilages or other tissues so this you this is again a revision but very uh, nice diagram showing a stimulus and this lead to disturbance in the cell membrane and you know that by the action of phospholipids e a2 on phospholipids of the cell membrane there is formation of arachidonic acid and this process is inhibited by corticosteroid remember when we studied corticosteroid that synthesis of arachidonic acid from the prostate gland uh, uh, phospholipids of the cell membrane is inhibited by phospholipase a2 and this inhibition of phospholipase a2 is by the action of corticosteroid so corticosteroid inhibit the inflammatory process from the beginning and after arachidonic acid formation you can see that by the action of lipoxygenase on it there, there is leukotriene formation and leukotrienes all types of leukotrienes these are formulated and they are, these are synthesized and they also have got a role in inflammation as well as in bronchospasm. Then by the action of cyclooxygenase on this arachidonic acid, there is formation of prostaglandin, thromboxanes and prostacycline and this is very important because today we will discuss NSAIDs which will inhibit cyclooxygenase and this will lead to inhibition of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 inhibition will lead to no synthesis of prostaglandin no synthesis thromboxin and prostacycline so effects uh, will be seen by decreasing prostaglandin decreasing thromboxanes and decreasing prostacycline and remember this is acetyl salicylic acid that is aspirin so aspirin and other NSA they inhibit the cyclooxygenase and this will ultimately will lead to decreased formation of prostaglandin, decreasing the inflammatory process, de decreasing thromboxane and decreasing ultimately inflammation and decreasing prostacycline. So this diagram or this slide again showing the same actions of different leukotrienes in prostaglandin in inflammatory response. So what are the common effects of NSAIDs as we, we are familiar with these drugs as I told you th these are analgesic, these are antipyretic and having anti-inflammatory action and except acetaminophen, acetaminophen is paracetamol, it is having no anti-inflammatory activity, we will see in detail that why it is having no anti-inflammatory activity and then some shown to inhibit activation aggregation and adhesion of, and adhesion of neutrophils and release of lysosomal enzymes and you can see here some are uricosuric I mean uricosuric action but most of the these NSAIDs they are competitive and reversible inhibitor of COX enzyme COX1 as well as COX2 but remember the difference between other NSAID and aspirin is that aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid this lead to acetylation of isozyme coenzyme isozyme co um, COX1 and COX2 and inhibit them irreversibly because it acetylate these enzymes so aspirin here you will remember one thing which is very important that the difference between NSAIDs and aspirin is that it is acetyl salicylic acid so it acetylates the COX1 and COX2 enzyme which lead to irreversible inhibition of this enzyme. Now we'll see what is the classification of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are classified 
on the basis of their chemical structure and you can memorize as such or you can just memorize the, the names of these drugs. So non-selective COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors include salicylic acid derivatives which number one a prototype drug is aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid then diflucinol is also included under the heading of salicylic acid derivative then we have got second group that is propionic acid derivative having less serious side effects naproxen ibuprofen fluorbuprofen and ketoprofen you are familiar with brufen these are brufen like drugs then naproxen is also included in this group then we have got acetic acid derivatives in which a very old drug that is indomethacin this is having very strong anti-inflammatory activity then etodolac diclofenac we are familiar with dichloran this is diclofenac then another compound that is ketorolac which is used as antipyretic mainly and then we have got sulindac then tolmitin and then nebumitone which is a protrap then analogic acid derivatives this include a long acting drug that is pyroxicam its plasma half life is up to 50 hours which may be prolonged up to 75 hours in elderly then meloxicam and an older drug which is producing a lot of adverse effects which is not mainly used nowadays that is phenylbutazone also under the heading of this anolic acid derivatives so pyroxicam and meloxicam these are longer acting NSAs and these are given just once daily then another group is phenamic acid derivatives this is phenam mephenamic acid and meclofenamic acid mephenamic acid is ponstone we are you are familiar with ponstone and mephenamic acid is ponstone uh, then muco, um, meclofenamic acid that is under phenamic acid derivatives then alkanones and this include nebumitone then we have got another group which is a selective inhibitor of cox2 and in this we have got salicoxib, valdicoxib, proficoxib and atoricoxib and many of these drugs they produce adverse effects for which we will discuss these adverse effects and for which the, they are they have been withdrawn from the market but salicoxib it comes with a special uh, special care and caution in their shoes because it can lead to a serious adverse effect that is related to thromboembolism. Then in the end we will discuss paracetamol in detail. So I revise classification you can memorize the names of the drugs important drugs or pro prototype is aspirin then naproxen ibuprofen flurbiprofen ketoprofen indomethacin etodolac diclofenac torolac sulindac uh, uh, tolmitin and nebumitone then pyroxicam meloxicam phenylbutazone then mephenamic acid meclofenamic acid and then the selective drugs which are COX-2 selective, salicoxib, valdicoxib, uh, roficoxib and etoricoxib and in the end we will discuss paracetamol. So these drugs they have got some common therapeutic indications and adverse effects while different kinetics and potencies and different chemical families as we have seen already but the common mechanism is they, they are inhibitor of COX-1 and COX-2 but they show different selectivity for COX-1 and COX-2. The similarities are more striking as compared to their differences. So this diagram is showing chemical similarities. You can see the chemical nature of these drugs as 
we have seen this in while classifying an acids that aspirin acetyl salicylic acid derivatives these you can see that sodium salicylate and diflunisol then in acetic acid we have got ketorolac and nomethacine tolmetin nebumetone and cylindac and etodolac and diclofenac the same this is the same classification because this is according to the chemical similarities salicoxib and decoxib all under this heading and then in all acid derivatives by doxycam meloxicam and in the end acetaminophen or paracetamol this is showing the plasma half life having smaller plasma half life from 1 hour up to 10 hour and the longer plasma half life that is up to 60 hours you can see by roxicam meloxicam they are these drugs having very long duration of action while diclofenac which you are familiar dichloran with the name of dichloran it is given three times a day while the longer acting that is given just one time a day and these are intermediate acting drugs which can be given twice a day then this is selectivity for cox uh, cox 1 or cox 2 more selective for cox 1 unselective and then more selective for cox 2 you can see here that these are roficoxib and all these selective drugs valdicoxib they are having more selectivity but you get for cox 2 by meloxic cam and diclofenac also show some more selectivity towards cox 2 but they can have effect on the cox 1 as well and other drugs they are showing varying affinity for cox 1 as these drugs now we will see that how is the pharmacokinetic of these N acid as organic acid the compounds generally are well absorbed orally and most of them 90 to 95 percent show plasma protein binding mainly with the albumin and these drugs these are by transformed in the liver and get excreted from the kidneys so principal route of elimination of most of the NSA is hepatic biotransformation and then excretion by the kidneys. These drugs they can show accumulation in the site of inflammation where the pH is lower and that is because of iron trapping. Mechanism of action as we have discussed already but I revise it for you that these NSAIDs, these are inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 and in this way they inhibit the formation of prostaglandins and if we talk about the prototype of the drug that is aspirin, it is an irreversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 while other NSAIDs, they inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 reversibly. So, Aspirin is an irreversible inhibitor of COX-1 and COX-2 while other NSAIDs they are they show this inhibition which is reversible. This is again a diagram which is showing how tissue injury can lead to activation of the phospholipids and formation of arachidonic acid and out of these arachidonic acid leukotrienes will be formed which can lead to bronchoconstriction but when COX-1 and COX-2, COX-1 is constitutional while COX-2 is inducible they can lead to formation of different prostaglandins and these prostaglandin when we talk about their action in the stomach these are cytoprotective prostaglandin prostaglandin e2 protect gastric mucosa and aid in platelet aggregation also and you can see here that prostaglandin 2 that is leading to inflammatory prostaglandin synthesis recruiting inflammatory cells sensitized skin pain receptors leading to pain at the area and regulate hypothalamic temperature control leading to 
fever also. So you can see that COX-1 and COX-2 leading to formation of different prostaglandins. These are inhibited by aspirin and other NSAIDs. And you can see here again the COX-2 selective inhibitors can also inhibit the COX-2 COX-2 as well as other NSAIDs and aspirin it can also inhibit COX-2 activity and leading to decreased inflammatory prostaglandin action. So cyclooxygenase 1, what's the difference between COX-1 and COX-2? Co COX-1 is a housekeeping enzyme. This regulates normal cellular process such as gastric cytoprotection, vascular homeostasis, platelet aggregation and kidney function. Remember these are the housekeeping enzyme and if you will inhibit this enzyme naturally there will be disturbance which will lead to adverse effects also. So what are the function? Gastric cytoprotection, vascular homeostasis, platelet aggregation and kidney function and responsible for physiological production of prostanoids. Then COX-2 which is causes the elevated production of prostanoid that occurs at the site of disease and inflammation. It is inducible and it is produced or induced when there is disease or inflammation. So non-selective COX inhibitors hinders normal physiological functions whereas selective COX-2 inhibitors only block the inflammatory reaction but itself it also has got other uh, serious adverse effects which will we will we will discuss afterwards this you can see cox1 cox2 and cox3 and cox1 constitutively throughout the body organ pain platelet function stomach protection and nsa including aspirin will inhibit cox1 while COX-2 inducible and constitutive in the brain and kidney and it is inducible where there is inflammation, pain and fever and constitutive at the synaptic plasticity. NSAID and COX-2 selective inhibitor salicoxib as well as aspirin will inhibit COX-2 enzyme. Then COX-3 constitutively high in the brain and heart and its function is pain in the pain pathways and but no inflammation pathways are affected by COX-3 and what is the inhibitor that is acetaminophen and some of NSAIDs and acetaminophen remember it is paracetamol. Now we will come to see the actions of aspirin, the salicylates or the aspirin acetyl salicylic acid and in 1829 it was found from the willow bark a tree from the bark of a tree it was extracted and this was aspirin in 1829 it can cause irreversible remember it acetylate the enzyme so it lead to irreversible inactivation of cyclooxygenase acting on both cox1 as well as on cox2 Aspirin, it's given orally, rapidly absorbed, 75% metabolized in the liver and 85% is excreted in alkaline urine and 5% in acidic urine. So you can see by alkalinization of the urine, the excretion of aspirin that can be increased. Now we'll see the pharmacological actions of aspirin. As I told you, aspirin is a prototype of these NSAIDs, so most of the actions or pharmacological effects of aspirin, they are similar to other NSAIDs. So first action is antipyretic action, that is aspirin when it is taken rapidly effective in febrile patients and in patients who are having fever, there is decrease in the temperature, yet has little effect on normal body temperature. Then aspirin is having anti-inflammatory effect. The primary clinical application of this, uh, this aspirin is in musculoskeletal disorders 
such as rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and for anti-inflammatory effect it is given in a very big dose that is 2500 to 4000 milligram per day. Analgesic effect as we are familiar that aspirin can be used for the headache and other pains is usually effective for from low to moderate intensity pain and like integumental pain it is really better than the pain from hollow viscera so hollow viscera pain is affected less as compared to integumental pain like headache and other aches and pain and the dosage for analgesic effect is 300 milligram to 2400 milligram remember this is an important question in which we ask you different dosage for the different uses of aspirin then aspirin can show antiplatelet action and the dose for this is from 75 milligram to 325 milligram so this is called mini aspirin also or baby aspirin in a smaller dose from 75 milligram to 325 milligram it inhibits the thromboxane A2 formation and this will lead to antiplatelet activity and especially we use aspirin for this purpose in cardiovascular patient then how aspirin relieves the pain this is by two actions, one is peripheral action and other is central mechanism. And in peripheral action or peri peripheral mechanism, it inhibits the synth synthesis of prostaglandins in the inflamed tissue and this prevents the sensitization of pain receptors to both mechanical and chemical stimuli. So it inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandin and this leads to prevention of the sensitization of pain receptors both mechanically as well as chemically then it has got a central action also central analgesic action is there the analgesic site exists in close proximity to the antipyretic regions in the hypothalamus so central action is in hypothalamus by which it shows analgesic activity so analgesia is by two ways one is peripheral effect by inhibiting the prostaglandin synthesis and by inhibiting the stimulation of pain receptors and the second is by a central analgesic effect in hypothalamus remember aspirin analgesic action is not associated with mental alterations such as hypnosis or changes in sensation other than the pain so there is no sedation or there is no hypnosis as we see with other narcotic analgesics then other action on the respiratory system when aspirin used in high dosage it can lead to middle breast stimulation leading to hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis because of hyperventilation a lot of carbon dioxide is released leading to respiratory alkalosis and this can be compensated through the kidney by increased excretion of bicarbonates while toxic doses remember we are talking about high doses and then we are talking about toxic doses of very prolonged administration can depress the middle breed system or middle breed nuclei and this result in an uncompensated respiratory acidosis so very high or prolonged use or very toxic dosage can lead to depression of the middle breed centers and this can lead to uncompensated respiratory acidosis then cardiovascular effects of aspirin these are very important because aspirin as you will see that it is used prophylactic, prophylactically to reduce the thromboembolic events in coronary and cerebral circulation because and this ultimately lead to long term survival and reduce frequencies of frequency of second myocardial infarction because of its antiplatelet activity this we will discuss in more detail 
High doses may cause peripheral vasodilatation by exerting a direct effect on smooth muscles and toxic doses depress circulation directly or by central vasomotor paralysis and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema may occur in elder patient on long-term salicylate therapy. Remember, this is with very high dose peripheral vasodilatation can occur and toxic doses can lead to central vasomotor paralysis and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But in very small dose, which we have seen already, that is 75 to 325 milligram, mini aspirin that is used as antiplatelet because thromboxin A2 is inhibited, synthesis is inhibited and this leads to antiplatelet activity and aspirin can be used prophylactically to reduce thromboembolic events in coronary and cerebral circulation and long term lead to long term survival and reduce frequency of second myocardial infarction attack. Then in gastrointestinal system, aspirin is very notorious for epigastric distress. It can lead to nausea and vomiting by irritating the gastric mucosal lining and this, this, is, this is because of oil trapping also because it is an acidic drug and this can lead to damage to the mucosa by being trapped in the mucosal lining cells and it stimulates the chemoreceptor trigger zones in the CNS also. So it can lead to irritation of the gastric mucosa and it can stimulate the chemoreceptor receptor trigger zone in the CNS. So central as well as local effect can lead to gastrointestinal adverse effect. Nausea vomiting is there. Then there can be dose related gastric ulceration and this ulcer they can show bleeding and there can be erosive gastritis because of inhibition of formation of prostaglandin E2 which you remember when we studied the treatment of acid peptic disease that normally prostaglandin E2 is having cytoprotective role it leads to increased formation of mucus as well as it increases the uh, pH of the mucus and as well as it decreases acid production. So prostaglandin E2 is cytoprotective in gastric area. So when there is inhibition of the synthesis of prostaglandin E2, this cytoprotective mechanism is disturbed and this lead to ultimately damage as well as to the mucosa leading to gastric ulceration. So there will be inhibition of the gastric acid excretion and there will be inhibition of the mucus excretion, inhibition of the PA, uh, bicarbonate ion excretion and this ultimately will lead to gastric ulceration and there can be bleeding, there can be erosive gastro gastritis. Salicylate induced gastric bleeding is painless and may lead to an iron deficiency anemia and slowly painless bleedings over a long period can lead to appearance of iron deficiency anemia in these patients who are on long term therapy with aspirin. Then hepatic effects, dose dependent hepatic damage can occur, usually asymptomatic, but in initial phases, elevated plasma transaminase levels are the key indication of hepatic insult. So if you want to go for hepatic functions, hepatic transaminase levels, they can be and their raised level can be an indication for the hepatic damage. So, so you have to be careful so dose dependent hepatic damage can be seen and more severe and associated with encephalopathy is seen in Ray's syndrome Ray's syndrome we will see uh, we will discuss this in detail because this is again a very important adverse effect of aspirin which appears in children and this is very important SEQ also as well as MCQ uh, sorry, uh, so your viva question that what is Ray's syndrome? So, Ray's syndrome 
aspirin and other salicylate when given to viral infections in children then it can be associated with an increased incidence of Reyes syndrome and what happens in Reyes sy syndrome there is fulminating hepatitis with encephalopathy and ultimately cerebral edema is there this can be even fatal so aspirin is contraindicated in children who have got viral infection have got fever with viral infection so because it can lead to Reyes syndrome and in Reyes syndrome two main major systems they are affected that is fulminating hepatitis and there is cerebral edema and encephalopathy symptom are there so this is specially encountered in children and so therefore it should not be the children having fever should not be given aspirin rather they should be given acetaminophen instead of aspirin means especially when this medication is required to reduce the fever and it is said that ibuprofen is also appropriate but remember in case of any viral infection or uh, with fever when you want to decrease the fever by using any uh, NSAID or other uh, 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 drug like aspirin you will use acetaminophen you will not use aspirin or other NSAIDs because of the fear of Reyes syndrome and what happens in Reyes syndrome there is hepatitis and there can be cerebral edema or encephalopathy then hematological effect aspirin inhibit the platelet degradation by decreasing the production of thromboxane A2 which we discussed that this can be a use as a, an antiplatelet effects that can be a use in cardiovascular patient and in doses greater than 6 gram per day aspirin may reduce plasma prothrombin levels also so plasma prothrombin levels they, they, they can be reduced in very big dose of aspirin and it should antiplatelet effect by inhibiting thromboxin A2 and so hematological effects leading to bleeding tendencies can be seen with aspirin. Then renal effects can result from salt and water retention remember when we discussed diuretics, diuretics as we know that prostate glandins they are having diuretic activity as well as they increase renal blood flow so when you will inhibit prostaglandin synthesis this will lead to salt and water retention because of decreased prostaglandin synthesis there is decreased renal blood flow there is decreased diuretic activity and more salt and water that can be retained and ultimately there is this can lead to even renal damage and then metabolic effect there can be hyperglycemia and glucosuria when aspirin is used in large doses and then adrenal effects they can be also seen that is stimulation of steroid excretion in when aspirin is used in very large doses so hyperglycemia glycosuria as well as stimulation of adrenal steroid in case of high dose of aspirin that can be seen so this finishes the pharmacological actions of aspirin as in today's lecture we have seen the classification of NSAIDs and we have seen the difference between NSAIDs and aspirin. Aspirin is a prototype of these NSAIDs but it differs because of its action or irreversible action on COX-1 and COX-2 and we have seen the pharmacological actions of aspirin which are almost most of the in most of the systems are almost similar to other NSAIDs. In second lecture, we will see what are the clinical uses, contraindications of aspirin, as well as we will see the other uses of other NSAIDs. Thank you. Thank you very much.